Well, good morning, everyone, and happy new year. I think I'm ready for a whole new year. I think I'm ready for what the new year brings and all the excitement that comes with that. Um, but I want to start this morning. Uh, I, I heard this story this week uh, about this elderly gentleman. What he does is uh, when he meets people for the first time, rather than simply asking Think, common questions that we would ask, like what do you do for a living or something like that, he asks this very pointed question that catches people off guard. He starts with, what have you done that you believe in and you are proud of? Now that's a pretty intense question for first meeting someone, you know, when you first get to know them, but he's asking this question because he wants people to think about the fact that there is a greater purpose for their life than simply just living a job or doing a job, living your life. And he's gotten some interesting questions, even though this has kind of unsettled people at first when he meets them. One woman answered this way, I'm doing a good job raising my three children. Or by a cabinet maker who said, I believe in good workmanship and I practice it. Or by another woman who said, I started a bookstore and it's the best bookstore for miles around. And he says, I don't really care how they answer, he said. I just want them to put the thought into their minds that they should live their lives in such a way that they can have a good answer. Not a good answer for me, not a good answer for themselves. That's what's important. I think we would change that a little bit as Christians, that it's not just about a good answer for ourselves, but it's a good answer that is faithful to what the Bible says and that we could recognize who we are, who we have been made to be, what God has designed for us to be, and recognize that this is what we need to do and how we need to live. But unfortunately, many Christians don't live in this manner and wouldn't be able to answer this old, ma old man's question in a biblical and meaningful way. And in many ways, it'd probably be more answering the question more along the lines of what the world would have to say. Far too many Christians are distracted by the cares of the world and aren't focused on what Christ has in store for them. Or others wallow in immaturity, kind of stay in these same patterns of behavior, making excuses for their behavior because that doesn't reflect Christ, don't know any other way to live. And many flat out don't even know what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. What that looks like, how they're supposed to live and think that Christianity is simply, is simply this way of just having fire insurance. That when they've made a mistake, they just ask for forgiveness and it's good and it's covered. But let me, let's make clear that this morning that the call of the disciple is to put their faith in Christ alone for salvation and recognize that his grace gives them a greater purpose of living to do his works. So this morning, we're going to look at three statements that a disciple knows is true of their call to follow Christ. So I invite you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2. This is going to be verses 1 through 10. And if you don't have a Bible, I invite you to pull. There's should be a brown hardcover back Bible in front in the seat in front of you. You can open that up. That'll be on page 1174. And so before we move on, I want to kind of give you a couple of pieces of background. First of all, this is a letter to the people in the city of Ephesus that the Apostle Paul wrote. And in the city of Ephesus at this time when Paul wrote, there was this temple devoted to the Greek goddess Artemis that was full of all kinds of practices that we would definitely say are not of the Christian faith. These things were immoral. These were taking advantage of people, that, not good practices, okay? And so the Ephesians would have it would be very easy to make a clear delineation between who is not a follower of Christ and who is a follower of Christ based on the way that they lived. And so they needed to have a recognition that this is something they needed to continue to do to live in a completely different way than the rest of the world. And this is in particular has to do with their daily lives, how they live every little moment of their lives. And then when we look at this, it's about being a true disciple of Christ, to follow the call that I already mentioned before. And one of the first times we see this word disciple being used differently than simply just a student is when we look at this in Matthew 18. It should be on the screen, or Matthew 28. It'll be on the screen, verses 18 through 20. Look at this. Just look at what Jesus says right before he ascends into heaven. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. This is his commissioning. He's basically saying, this is what I want you to do. This is now your job description as a follower of Christ is to make disciples. So you are a disciple who makes disciples. And you baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you and I am with you always to the end of the age. Like this is the job description for us as Christians that we are now to go and make disciples. Now, 
We need to understand what a disciple actually is because we have to understand this great commission is not the great suggestion. This is not merely a good idea of the way that you could live. This is the command. This is what God has laid out for us for every single person to do. And so we need to clarify something really quick. There's absolutely no room for a person to call themselves a Christian and not be considered a disciple. If you claim to believe in him, then you are his disciple and you will seek to live what that means. There is no such thing as a category, a difference between a Christian and a disciple. They are one and the same. So if you are a Christian, you are a disciple. That means you are a follower of Christ. Now, I had to take a couple seminary classes in the last year uh, as part of getting my master's that, that's about discipleship. And these were highly impactful classes for me. And in one of my assignments, I actually had to like write my own definition of a disciple. And this is what I came up with after looking through scripture. A disciple is a person who believes in the risen Christ for salvation, strives to reflect Christ with their lives, and labors to declare Christ to the world in making disciples. It is very crucial for us to know that this is the definition and that this is what our call is as Christians to now that this is what we do. And, and if it's hard for you to remember a definition like this, let, let's bring it down even further into three characteristics. Just use these three words and remember them. If you put them in order like this, it'll, it'll make sense. First is to believe, to have beliefs about Jesus that come straight from his word and trust in him alone for your salvation. Second is to reflect. In the way that the disciple lives, they filter every decision and behavior through the lens of reflecting the life of Jesus Christ who made them in his image. And then lastly, to declare, to proclaim the gospel to the world through your words and through the works that God has designed for you to do. Believe, reflect, declare. These are the three characteristics of a disciple. And if you look at your life, if you're a follower of Christ, these three things should be evident at all times that you are believing the, the right things, believing in God's word and what it says about who Jesus is and what he has done, that you seek to reflect Jesus in the way that you live and that you seek to declare his gospel to the entire world. It's really important for us to understand. So I wanted to make sure to clarify that before we continue so that we kind of had that, that foundation as we look at Ephesians chapter 2. So let's go ahead and read verses two, or chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So Paul makes a very definitive statement here, again, about what we used to be. This, this is who we were before we came to know Christ. This is our, our status before we came to know Jesus, and that we, are, that we were absolutely dead in our sin. And this is basically meaning that being spiritually dead, because obviously we're not physically dead right here if you're in this room, but we are spiritually dead, meaning that there is no possibility of having any sort of communication between us and God, any kind of relationship with God that would be of any benefit to us because we are born into sin. We call this the sin nature, the sin condition. And what this means is that sin is more than just like bad choices that we make, bad decisions that we make, but sin is actually this condition that is in our hearts that we cannot cure on our own. This is something that we are born into that just comes from our humanity from all the way back, going back to Adam and Eve, that has been built into us. And so we are now, we can't possibly make ourselves alive. We can't do this. And so in this state, we are ruled by a whole different kingdom. We are ruled by the kingdom of, and he's very, Paul's very blunt here, that this is Satan who's in charge of this, okay? This is Satan who is the one, the ruler of the power of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And so Paul is making this very clear. If a person is not a believer in Christ. They are dead in their sins. They have no hope of having a relationship with Christ. They have no hope in their world of having a purpose and no hope of the future of what eternity is going to look like for them. And in some ways, they just kind of go after what they crave. They go after what they desire, gratifying themselves. But notice what Paul is doing here. Look at how he phrases these things. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. You used to live when you followed the ways of the world. And it goes on and on and on like this in the past tense. This is who you used to be. 
This is not who you are now. If you have put your faith in Christ, this is not who you are now. That is your old self. That is gone and dead. That is beyond that. We have been saved. We have been changed. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But this is our first statement that we're going to look at this morning. Is that a disciple knows that there is no hope apart from Christ. Paul is reminding the Ephesians here that they have to remember, this is who you used to be. God has saved you from this, this spiritual death, and now he has raised you up. And we'll look at that in a minute. But this death, you had no hope apart from Christ. Christ had to be the one to bring you to new life because a dead thing cannot do anything for itself. It is simply a dead thing. So that's what we used to be. This is who we were at one time. But here's something that we need to consider and think about this morning. Is how often do we kind of dip back into that old life? Kind of tease back into that and try and pull something out. Sometimes we, we live in this duplicitous life where we say, Oh yes, I'm a Christian. I've been saved. I've been forgiven. But then we make excuses for behavior and things that we do that we know aren't right. You might lie to your boss about something. You might call in sick when you actually aren't sick. You might lie on a report in order to fudge the numbers so that it looks like you're doing better than you actually are. Or you could be someone who, you know, cheats on tests because a teacher treated you wrong. I mean, I, even after I gave my life to Christ, that was something I still did a few times where I just felt this urge to cheat because I wanted to get a good grade. But you can't, we can't live in this kind of duplicitous life. We have to live in a way that we say we're going to model our lives after Jesus Christ. But we have to also recognize that we cannot begin to believe that we could move ourselves out of that on our own effort. That is all based on Christ. And we only have hope because of who he is and what he has done. And this is what a disciple recognizes. And that a disciple also recognizes that they make a decisive break from who they used to be and move forward in who God is making them to be. And so let's continue. We're going to look at that and what that means. Look at verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Some translations even put this as, but God. I like to call this the greatest plot twist in all of human history. Instead of who we used to be, this being dead in our transgressions and sins, but God. God intervened and did something on our behalf. We have to understand this by looking at a couple different words that are in here. When it says because of his great love for us, this word is uh, the Greek word agape. It's an awesome, awesome Greek word. And what it means is to seek the highest good in the one loved. As we'll see, the, one, the highest good is more than just forgiving us of our sins, but raising us up to a whole new life. We'll look at that in a minute. And then secondly, when he says, God, who is rich in mercy, this word mercy is, the, is this word in Greek. Okay, follow me on this. This is a little difficult. This is the word in Greek that they used when the Old Testament was translated into Greek from Hebrew to translate the Hebrew word chesed. That's a fun word to say. To, to clear your throat, chesed. What chesed means is it's God's loyal covenantal love. That when God makes a promise that he is faithful to finish it, that God is faithful to carry it out. You know, when God makes a covenant, he seals it upon himself. He's the one who says, I'm the one who's going to accomplish this. I'm the one that's going to fulfill it. A covenant is a beautiful concept that it, it's a, I've heard this definition once and I loved it, a relationship with God on his terms. That he creates the terms and then it's staked on him that if he doesn't follow through on that covenant, then he is not who he says he is. But we know, looking back, that God has fulfilled his promises by coming in Jesus Christ. That covenant has been fulfilled. So this is God's rich mercy, God's rich love. But this is what he accomplished. Look at this. That he made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. So even though this is what we were, we were dead in our transgressions, we had no hope apart from Christ, he made us alive. Now I want you to understand this. When you look at this phrase, when you look at these statements, he doesn't say anything about forgiveness of sins. 
It's not that that isn't important. That is still a very important piece of what Christianity is all about. But the gospel in and of itself, the most important piece of it is that we would be made alive when we used to be dead. That Christ has raised us up to give us this new life, that we would be the people that he designed us to be from the beginning. That he raised us up and made us alive with Christ. To be a whole new person, to be a whole new creature that goes about living as God designed you to live. That is the absolute hope of the gospel for this life, that we would be raised to this new life and not left in our sin. But also look at what he, he says here. Make sure you understand this. It is by grace you have been saved. We'll talk about this more later, but it's by God's grace, a gracious gift that God has given to you that you did not muster up. You did not earn in any way. He gave it to you. But look at what he says. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now, the way he phrases this, it sounds like if we were to look around right now, we would be seated in heaven right now. But I think we can take a moment and look around and know we're not there. We're not in heaven right now. Something's a little different. The way that Paul phrases this, he phrases it this way because it's as good as done that we are seated with Christ already. Because of who God is and how he is faithful to finish. When he goes back, when we go back to Ephesians chapter 1, we see that it says that the Holy Spirit was given to us as a pledge, as a deposit, or a better way to put it, as a down payment guaranteeing the inheritance to come. That someday we know that this is coming, that we would someday come to having this all fulfilled, that we would be raised up in, with Christ, seated with him in heaven because of the Holy Spirit coming to our life as a down payment, guaranteeing this is happening. So the question then becomes, how do we know that this Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, is making us alive, has guaranteed this spot for us? I want you to just think about these questions. And if you can say yes to these questions, then the Holy Spirit is living in you and is doing a work and God, trust me, is going to be faithful to finish it. That's what he does. But if you can't say yes to this, if you say no to these questions, then that's the moment where you start to say, I need to take stock and inventory about myself. I need to take a serious look in my heart and see if there is something that needs to change because right now, that means I'm not truly devoting myself to Christ and I don't have the Holy Spirit living in me. So here's some of the questions. First of all, are you convicted by sin? Not necessarily like that you, you feel bad or you feel, sh you know, you feel shame for it. Like, you, oh, oops, I made a mistake. But that you actually see it and you go, absolutely, that was 100% the wrong thing. I have disobeyed God. I have rebelled against God with that choice. And God, I want to be different. I want to do something else. God, change me. Like that, that's conviction that says that, Yes, it's me. I take ownership for it. I did it. Nobody else did it. I can't blame anybody. It was my choice. If you're convicted by sin, that's the Holy Spirit. That, he is working in you. Do you want to grow in your relationship with Christ? Do you look at it and you go, man, I don't know enough. I want to learn more. I want to grow. I want to get better at this. I want to do this better. I want to know what this faith teaches better. Do you want to know his word more? Do you look at his word and say, man, this thing is confusing. I don't get it, but I want to know it. I want to learn it. I want to get to know God through this. Do you want to tell others about who he is? Do you want, do you see that maybe, and maybe it does, it's not perfect. It's awkward sometimes to try and tell people about Jesus, but there's a desire in you that you want to see that happen. That's something that God works in us. And do you see yourself becoming more like Christ as time goes by in your life? Do you see yourself changing? See yourself reflecting Jesus more throughout your life? If you see that growth happening, then you can then that is, that, is an ans that is a yes answer. And so let me just make sure I say this. If in, in asking those questions, if you said no, this is the moment to take inventory and stock. And I implore you, do not walk away this morning without having considered this faith, considered it. Especially if you have never given your life to Christ, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus before, think about this because the cost is huge. The cost is an eternity separated from God. And, and even so, in the immediate now, like the, the cost is not to be living the life that you have been designed to live. The, you, that to not be raised to a new life in Christ. And so hear this. This is your greater purpose. That answer that you could give to that man if he came to you, that you say, I would live for Christ. 
And so here's our statement number two, is that a disciple knows that grace is more than just forgiveness of sins, but of a life raised from spiritual death. That we would recognize that we don't live in some fantasy world that we have been able to make something up of ourselves on our own effort, that it has all been by the grace of God that this has happened. And these gifts, as he even puts it, they're incomparable. Other translations put it as immeasurable. We can't even comprehend how it could be measured and put together. This is the wealth of God's grace. And sometimes what we do is we simply limit it to just a covering of our sin, which is a huge part of it, but we're missing some of the greater aspects of God's gifts and that he is bestowing upon us, these riches. And let's not miss this either. The riches here are not material riches. If anyone tells you that, they don't understand the Bible. This is not about material wealth. This is the riches of being reconciled to God, of being equipped to serve him, to be empowered to walk away from sin and to be a vessel of his grace to this broken world. That is what these riches and these gifts are all about so that you would be used as a vessel to bring about change, bring about the gospel into this world that would change people's hearts and change our world. Let's continue verses eight, verse eight. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So Paul kind of reiterates his points at this juncture, but what he's saying is, for it is by grace you have been saved. Remember, it's this gift that he has given to us, but it's through faith. You have to put your faith in Christ. That's the thing that we do. We say, Jesus, I believe that you did this. I'm putting my faith in you. I'm putting my trust in you. You did this. I cannot accomplish this on my own because I was dead in my transgressions. So God, you did it. You do it. I put my faith in you. And he says, it is the gift of God is not from yourselves and not by works so that no one can boast. There is absolutely no Christian on this planet who could possibly claim that they have mustered this up for themselves or even mustered up growth. So even when we think about, you know, in our day and age, kind of the, the penultimate Christian in our minds is a lot of people th immediately think of Billy Graham. Billy Graham can't make this claim. He can't boast. The point of this is that no one can boast. Nobody has enough goodness within them to be able to boast that they, were, they made themselves right before God. No one can claim that. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, but we have this treasure, this treasure of salvation in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. This power comes from God, not from us. We live in this dependent vessel that's, that's totally dependent on God for grace and mercy to save us, to reconcile us, to change us, to make us new people, and to show that it is only through him that these things are possible. We can't make this happen. We can't change ourselves, but it is God who does that. And it's this a beautiful idea, but and the sooner that we can learn this and submit to this kind of power working in our lives, it's the sooner that we can live like the disciples he's called us to be. That we say, I'm just an empty vessel, God, you work. You use me, you work in me, you change me so that I can bring about your love, your mercy, your grace to this hurting and dying world. And then Paul uses this word in verse 10 that I think is awesome. For we are God's handiwork. Other translations translate it as workmanship. And it's this concept, this term of basically like a work of art, a masterpiece, something that was intimately put together and sometimes we can take this phrase and take it really far into self-esteem kind of movement where we start to think about, oh, God really loves me and take it more for ourselves. When really the whole point is, look at what he says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do what? Good works. You have been given, you have been worked in by God. God is working on you, molding you, shaping you like a masterpiece to do his good works. It's not for yourself to enjoy that you would feel better about yourself, but that you would be a vessel of his mercy to the rest of the world, that you would be used to do his good works. That God, look, God has prepared in advance, that God has destined from the beginning for you to have. And so we need to understand this. What are these good works? What are the good works he's talking about? I think if we could simplify it so that it's something that we can remember really easily and recall, it's to know him and to make him known. Just simplify it. 
Everything we do must be put through that filter to know him and make him known. That everything I go for, I, everything I, I choose to do is to try and make, to know him or make him known. That is what our life purpose is all about. Our life purpose isn't simply to live this life, to climb the corporate ladder, to be really successful in our career, to make a ton of money, to get straight A's in school, to get scholarships, to be well known and recognized for our abilities and talents. None of these are the purpose of our life. Those things can be used by God to know him and make him known, but that is our ultimate purpose. And so how are you doing that right now in your life? How are you living in a way that is knowing him and making him known? And if you look at your life and you can honestly say, I don't know that I'm doing that. How are you going to allow this change to happen in you today? In what ways are you going to start to seek that, you know what, I want to see this change in my life so that I can live in this way. What am I going to do differently so that I can know him and make him known? And so this is our final statement that we'll look at this morning. A disciple knows that this salvation leads to a calling to do his good works. Make sure you understand this. The grace of Jesus empowers you for service for his kingdom. It's not based on your abilities. Remember, no one can boast. It's about what God works in you so that you can do this. God empowers you to work and serve in his kingdom. And truly, let's make sure we understand this. You are not meant to be a passive obser observer of the kingdom, but an active participant. And I, I've heard this term used this way, and I really like it, but that you are a, that you when you give your life to Christ, you become a pocket of the kingdom. This little alcove of the kingdom that walks around wherever you go, wherever, when you go to work, when you go to school, when you go home, when you live in your neighborhood, when you go to the store, wherever it is you might find yourself going, that you would be a pocket and a representative of Jesus Christ wherever you go and to represent his love, his mercy, his grace in every aspect of your life. This is what God has done, that we would, you know, he used to be dead and so he's saved us, he's raised us to this new life to now do these good works. And so I want to close by talking about two very famous church leaders named John and Charles Wesley. A, they've written a lot of hymns. Uh, I was talking with somebody after service last time and they think it's somewhere in the 3,000 range, the hymns, okay? These men grew up in Christian homes, served Jesus, went on mission trips to tell people about Jesus and began to be frustrated with their efforts. And one of the problems they began to realize was that they were putting all the effort and all the, you know, all the gumption on it, on themselves. That it was them that had to do the work. That they were the ones that had to make, the, make God's message work and be, and be saved. And they realized that, you know what? We're not even really saved ourselves. That they looked at their own life and they saw that there were pieces of their life that didn't match up. And so they said, we are going to devote ourselves. We are going to change. We want to be different. And as a result, these are now two of the most influential godly men that have ever walked this earth. And so this is the kind of change that God wants to happen, God wants to do in each and every one of our lives. And I fear that many people, especially in our country where Christianity still has a fairly comfortable place in our society, that sometimes we are like John and Charles Wesley. We've grown up with this. We've learned this. We've heard this all our life. We believe it in our head, but it hasn't translated into here. That we would say, no, it's the whole point of this is that Jesus has raised me to a whole new life. That I would now live for him in every aspect of my life and that he changes me to be this vessel. That is the important thing for us to learn. So, what will you do now that you know that you know what the call of Christ is on those who claim to be his disciples. And let's remind ourselves of the whole point of all of this. The call of the disciple is to put their faith in Christ alone for salvation and recognize that his grace gives them a greater purpose of living to do his works. Let's pray. God, I'm just so thankful for the grace that you have given us. God, that it is a gift that we cannot boast about because it has been bestowed upon us. We have not been able to earn it. We have not been able to muster up any sort of strength, God, to get it. But God, we have been just graciously given it. And God, it's not just for our own benefit. God, it's for uh, 
bringing your gospel and bringing your kingdom to the rest of the world, that people would come to know you and be changed. God, to have their lives radically altered because of who you are. And so God, thank you for this work that you are doing in our lives. God, that you are molding us and shaping us to reflect you. God, may we believe you. May we seek to reflect you. And may we, may we seek to declare who you are to the world. And so God, we thank you for this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen.